Welcome to my second lecture on registered title. Here's just a reminder of where we are and where we're going. So in the first video in this series, I looked at the key features of registered title, including the very important provisions relating to priority. In this second video, I'm looking at section 27 in more detail. So I'm concentrating on which transactions relating to registered title in land must be completed by registration. Hello and welcome to my channel. My name's Amanda and I work as a private tutor in property law. If you find my videos helpful, please subscribe to my channel as it really does make a difference. Thank you. And if you're feeling really generous, perhaps you'd buy me a coffee by following the link in the description box. Now, this is just a couple of things that I mentioned in the first video. So please assume that any references to sections within this video are to the Land Registration Act 2002, unless I indicate to the contrary. And also assume that title to this land has already been registered. So I'm looking at the position where we have a registered estate, either a legal freehold or a legal lease with its own title number, proprietorship register, property register and charges register. So I'm not looking at first registration. And here's a quick reminder of what we saw in the first video. The three different categories of property rights that you need to know when dealing with registered title. So we have registrable dispositions, which is what I'm looking at today, minor interests and interests which override. And another reminder of what we did in the first video, we looked at the priority rules. So the rules concerning competing rights in land, which is a common situation in an assessment. So if a transaction in relation to land is a registrable disposition and it's made for valuable consideration and has been completed by registration, then that transaction or disposition takes priority over other prior interests unless those interests are protected. And that's the effect of section 27 and section 29. So if a registrable disposition is registered and the transaction is for valuable consideration, then the disposition or the transaction is given priority over pre-existing prior rights in the land unless those pre-existing rights are protected. But if a registrable disposition hasn't been completed by registration or the disposition wasn't for value, then it doesn't take priority over prior interests. And that's the effect of section 28. And here's the text of section 27, subsection 1. And just to remind you that the important words there are that it does not operate at law until the relevant registration requirements are met. So in other words, when a registrable disposition is completed by registration, the transaction relating to that estate or interest in the land only becomes legal when the registration is completed. And we also saw that protection in section 29, which is that the transferee or the disponee, as they are referred to in the Act, is then able to defend any claims by third parties with pre-existing rights whose rights are not protected. And remember that the disposition must be for valuable consideration in order to get the protection of section 29. And this is often a point forgotten by students. So the first thing that you should check when considering the priority of interests where title to the land has been registered is to check to see whether the disposition was for valuable consideration or not. And I know that many students find charts and tables useful, so here's another one in a different format. So you can see the three different ways of categorising proprietary rights under the Land Registration Act at the top there. But remember also that the same right can sometimes qualify as both a minor interest and overriding. So there can be a degree of overlap. So you can see under the left hand column that registrable dispositions must be completed in order to be legal 
and that they can take priority under Section 29 unless any of the exceptions to that rule apply. And those exceptions are that pre-existing right is either a registered charge or mortgage or that a notice has been entered onto the charges register of the burden land or that that interest overrides. I remember also that we saw that some rights can't be protected by notice, but the third party can ask for a restriction to be entered into the proprietorship register of the burden land, which can offer some limited protection. And I'll be looking at that in the next video. So to summarise, Section 29 says that when registered, the person who has registered the disposition takes the land free from all existing proprietary rights except for registered charges, protected registered interests by notice and interests which override. And here's another reminder, here's the charges register of the property that we were looking at in the first video, 28 Acacia Avenue. And just to throw in something that students often get confused about, although it's called the charges register, it doesn't only contain charges or mortgages, it also contains details of other third party rights which burden the land. So here you can see there are a couple of easement and restrictive covenants. And the other point to notice is it has nothing to do with land charges under the Land Charges Act 1972. That only applies to unregistered title. So if you've studied unregistered title and you've looked at land charges, that system has nothing to do with the registered title system. It's a completely different set of rules that apply to unregistered title. So it's nothing to do with the Land Charges Act. So finally, here we are at section 27, subsection 2. And as you can see, it tells us that the following are the dispositions which are required to be completed by registration. So it contains a list of six different property rights which are registrable dispositions. And before we dive into those specific transactions in detail, I just want to remind you about what the aim of the registered title system is. And the idea is that the register is kept up to date to reflect all the rights affecting the land and owners of the land. So we'll see that section 27 covers most situations where the owner of a registered estate gives a legal property right to somebody else either by transferring their legal estate to a new owner or by granting a new legal right to somebody else. So, for example, a new legal charge or a new legal lease. And that transfer or grant of a new legal right must be recorded at the land registry in order to take effect in law. Now, we're going to concentrate on these four registrable dispositions because they are the most likely ones that you're going to encounter in an assessment. So you can see that there are two estates. So these relate to ownership of the land and there are two third party rights. So rights enjoyed by people over somebody else's land. So here we have the first one in subsection 2a, a transfer. And that's referring to the transfer of a registered freehold estate and the transfer of a registered lease, which are the only two types of estates which are capable of being legal. So in this section, you're looking at the transfer of ownership of a legal freehold or a legal lease, which has already been registered. So if we look at the example taken from the first video of Mr. and Mrs. Bale, if you remember, they were the registered owners of the freehold estate to 28 Acacia Avenue and then they sold it to Paul and Pippa. That sale would involve the transfer of the freehold estate to Paul and Pippa so would fall within section 27.2a. Now note that there are some exceptions to that rule which I won't go into in detail but just as an example where a sole legal owner dies then the legal estate passes automatically 
to the executors of the owner's will. So the next one is subsection 2b, which as you can see, deals with the grant of a term of years absolute. And a term of years absolute is a lease. So we're looking at the grant of different types of leases covered in subsection B. And as you'll see, there are five types of leases which must be registered. And we're going to concentrate only on the first two, which are most commonly encountered in assessments. So we're going to be looking at a long lease and reversionary leases. So the first of those is the grant of a long legal lease. You can see that... The duration of the lease has to be for a term more than seven years from the date of grant. So when a new legal lease of more than seven years is granted, it is registered at the land registry. It will be given its own unique title number because it's an estate. And a note will also be put in the charges register of the registered freehold estate from which the lease has been granted. Now, just in case you're worried about the plight of tenants with shorter legal leases, you may have a, a short legal lease of your student accommodation yourself. Well, don't worry, they are protected because they override registrable dispositions and owners of equitable leases may protect their interest by entering a notice in the charges register or the lease may override if the tenant is in occupation. Just a reminder of the consequences of failure to register this newly granted lease, which exceeds seven years. So let's assume that we have a 10 year lease. Well, of course, that lease remains equitable until it becomes registered. What I want to do at this point is just to mention something that students often get wrong. So we need to look at the difference between the grant of a new lease, which we've just been looking at, in other words, the creation of a new lease, and the transfer of an existing registered lease. And just note that if you're dealing with the transfer of an existing registered lease, it doesn't matter how long is left to run on that lease. That transfer still needs to be registered. So as we've just seen, the grant of a new legal lease for more than seven years must be registered. So if we take the example of the grant of a 10 year lease, the tenant must register that lease in order for that lease to become legal. But now assume that eight years later, the first tenant decides to sell that lease and transfers it on to tenant two. Now, if you studied leases, this is called an assignment of a lease. Now, that sale of an existing lease would fall under Section 2A, not Section 2B, because now we're dealing with the transfer of an existing lease. And note that the fact that that lease now only has two years left to run is irrelevant. That change of ownership, that transfer from T1 to T2 is a registrable disposition. And just a shout out, if you find my videos useful, I'd be delighted to hear from you if you'd like to put your comments in the uh, comments box below. I'm afraid I can't answer students' individual queries in this way, but if you have any questions relating to the content of the video or just feedback, good or bad, then I would be delighted to hear from you. And incidentally, if you're new to my channel, I do try and take you through statutory provisions whenever I can. And there are two reasons for this. Firstly, you may have access to the statute either in an exam in the form of a property law statute book or if your assessment is a coursework. And if you have the statute, you don't have to learn and remember vast amounts of information. So if you get brain freeze in an exam, just open up your statute book and look at the statutory provisions. And if you're completing a coursework, you will, of course, have access to the statute and your answer will be better if you refer to the statutory provisions accurately. I have marked thousands and I do mean thousands of assessments and you can tell when the student has taken the time to refer to the statute rather than look at a general explanation in a textbook or 
simply relied on their own lecture notes. So the more accurate your referencing of statutory authority is, better the impression the marker will have of your work and also you're less likely to make a mistake. And the second reason is that students generally find reading statutory material very difficult, which is understandable because it is a unique legal skill. But like most things, you do get better with practice and it also helps your general legal skills, which if you're considering a career or a job in the legal field, you will need to be able to do. And now we have the second of those leases in subsection 2b that I'm going to look at and they are reversionary leases. A reversionary lease is a lease that is granted to take effect at some point in the future. So you can see here that if the lease is to take effect more than three months after the date of grant, then that lease is a registrable disposition and it doesn't matter how long that lease is for. So now we get to the first of the third party rights which have to be registered in order to be legal. So it's not a new estate being granted here, it won't get its own title number, but it does have to be completed by registration and noted in the charges register of the burdened land. So we're looking at the creation of new legal interests here. Section 27.2d covers easements and profits which have been deliberately created, so expressly created by a deed. And if you're new to studying law, an example of an easement would be a right of way over somebody else's land and a profit is the right to go onto somebody else's land and take something from that land which occurs naturally. And the classic example of that are grazing rights. So here's the wording of the Act, which refers to the express grant or reservation of an interest of a kind falling within Section 12A of the Law of Property Act 1925. So if we look in the Law of Property Act, Section 12A, we all see that it refers to easements and profits. Now note that these easements and profits must be legal, so they must be for a term equivalent to a fee simple, which is forever, or for a term of years absolute, and they must be created by deed because they need to be legal. However, if you have studied easements in some detail, just note the exception in subsection 7 there, where you'll see that this doesn't include rights which have been acquired as a result of section 62 of the Law of Property Act 1925. Don't worry if you haven't studied easements yet, you will come across section 62 when you start to study how these rights can be acquired. And then finally, as you would expect, the grant of a new legal charge, which for our purposes is a mortgage. That would be a registrable disposition. So it needs to be completed by registration in order to be legal. So to summarise what we've just seen in section 27, when does a disposition or a transaction relating to land need to be registered? So we've seen that the transfer of an existing registered legal estate has to be registered. And also note that this will include transfer of part of the land in the title. We've seen that the creation of a new long legal lease, an expressly granted easement or profit or a new legal charge are all registrable dispositions which have to be completed by registration. And finally, do remember if you have a question on third party rights and registered title, if you're not told in the facts of the question whether a particular right is legal or equitable, then you are going to have to look at the circumstances under which that right was acquired in order to work out for yourself whether it is legal or equitable. So you need to go back to the Law of Property Act 1925, Section 1, to see whether it's capable of being legal 
and also section 52, which says that in most circumstances, a deed is required in order to create a new legal estate or interest. And if you're unsure on that, check out my, my video series on how to work out whether a propriety right is legal or equitable. So thank you so much for watching. I do hope that you found that useful. In the next video, I will be looking at minor interests and notices and restrictions. So I'd be grateful if you would consider subscribing to my channel. And as I mentioned at the beginning, if you're feeling really generous, perhaps you would consider buying me a coffee by following the link in the description box. And if you're interested in private tuition, please contact me for further details. Thanks again for watching and good luck with your studies.